some time uh, to hear any feedback that you have about the ILC Institute. I hope your in, in experience has been enriching so far. And if there's any feedback that you'd like to share on what we can do to provide more value to you, I'd be happy to sort of take that on board. Uh, as far as today's session is, uh, goes, I mean, Ronnie needs no introduction, but I would also like to add, it's my absolute privilege to be doing this because apart from all the wonderful things he's done, he also happens to be my ex-boss. And um, so therefore, I, I will uh, ensure that I bring some of our, my personal experiences and anecdotes into this conversation so that you all not only understand uh, his business genius, but you'll also help, uh, it also helps you to gain an insight into the man himself. I hope you guys enjoy this. Thank you. So while Deepak's getting uh, mic'd, I think I, I just read this for the first time when I walked in here, and it's quite interesting because I, these are strong words that I all believe in. So maybe at some stage we'll take that up, yeah. especially my mantra on non-linear thinking. Okay. And um, I know everyone thinks of creative when you look at media, entertainment, all of that. But actually, creativity in almost every field that we're all involved in, I think, is really the core. But maybe we'll chat about that as we go. Yeah. Through. So the way we wanted to do this, uh, and I hope I'm audible, the way we wanted to do this was before we start asking Ronnie about you know, his, his business lessons, I think it would be important if you all got a glimpse into the kind of man he is and the value system or belief system that uh, sort of uh, he embodies, because I think our own value and belief system always sort of delves into our work life as well. Um, and I'm going to give you three examples of Your voice is working. <laughs> Otherwise, I can shout. No problem. Yeah. OK, great. OK. Um, so the first question, I think, is once you've you know, crossed Maslow's theories of hierarchy's first rule, which is your existence is no longer in question, which means had enough money in the bank. It had a beautiful house, etc. So then what does money mean to you? And the reason I asked ask this is, um, because he's got a wonderful house, which clearly is a labor of love for Zareena and you. But apart from that, I'm not going you to have any of the trappings that come with, with more money than you know what to do with. And I'm sure you'll disagree with the fact that you have more money than you know what to do with. But um, I'll give you an anecdote. So when, when, I joined, when I joined UTV, I think there were three business heads who were working with Ronnie. So there was MK Anand, who was running his entire TV business. There was Sid Roy Kapoor, who was running his... Um, and I've just come on board to check. Yeah, I've just come on board to bring those people into the partnership with all their family and things like that. Now, all of the companies we had set up in our career, so Ronnie was doing that, it was more than our previous job. And uh, we obviously wanted to give that money to build into the car and a new car. But you cannot build the car until you put the car in the car and put the car in the car. Ronnie would have an old car, I've got it. That I noticed. <laughs> that I definitely noticed. <laughs> and I think uh, the deep secret was more than three people actually bought new cars. <laughs> so, so, you clearly got into all these different businesses that travel. I mean, I think there's, there's a little bit of business people who used to come to work there and they would talk to people and they would teach us new cars, right? So, what is, what is money mean? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty long question for the right, up, the, uh, the right point and point that you put there. Firstly, I just want to clarify one thing. Uh, I think most of the time when you kind of met me, and for the entire period we were all worked together, all the way till 2012, um, I was actually, I would say, other than the one single asset that I had, which was my ownership in UTV, uh, and I remember that because almost every Sunday when I would go meet my parents, my dad, who then at that time was almost turning... 85 and 90, um, would always ask me, he says, I just don't get it. Because what is this one single company in which you own shares? What about Tata's? What about Billa's? What about all this? You know, what about mutual funds? And there was this whole, every Sunday, we'd have the same conversation. 
about why I wouldn't have a diversified portfolio and why I'm always borrowing money. So I think the very con context that you have there, no, I think it was 2012, everything was, the sum of the parts was the whole as far as I was concerned, it was all there. Um, so my best proof of pudding for that is that I borrowed, for most of my daughter's education, I think I borrowed money. So in 2012, there wasn't a liquidity event. So if I gave you the feeling that there was more money than I could do with it, uh, I obviously did a good job at communicating confidence because obviously then you have to please bankers, shareholders, and everybody else that you have more than what you have. Um, but actually the journey of an entrepreneur is very, very different when it comes to most of these things, where perception, I think, is half of that. But I'll tell you, if I can reflect what money means to, and I think it's a very general term. Yeah, I mean, at the end, the sense of accomplishment when you're creating something. I think when you're building something, wealth creation is a very important goal. If you don't have that goal and you keep questioning yourself as what does money mean to you, I think you're going to slip. So to me, the question of even today when I'm building Upgrad, making it a 20x of what I thought we built UTV was is an important goal for me. That doesn't mean that I now need to translate what does that mean in terms of money, but just wealth creation and a certain impact. And I can tell you, yes, I think, I think that drives people at a very different level. So I think today if I were to redo it again, I wouldn't calculate what's the bank balance. I just create what do I want to do in terms of wealth creation because that's a nomenclature in business for yourself, for your team members and your staff, and then for your shareholders if there are situations. So I think we should differentiate between what money means to you versus wealth creation. And I think did have a liquidity, which is when we sold our uh, company to, to Disney in 2012. I would say the first question that came about was actually that um, I was carrying on, and I had a five-year non-compete, but I was carrying on to build the company um, as a combined Disney and UTV. And Zarina, who had been one of my wife, who had also been a co-founder, I think within six months, um, she kind of crossed the road and said, this is no longer our company, and I think I'm going to move out. Um, at the end of one year, I felt as an entrepreneur that here was a phenomenal company like Disney um, who actually made us feel very entrepreneurial, even though you feel it's a large company. A long rope. But to me, as an entrepreneur, when I had to answer the question as to why I was moving out, because I sat there with the chairman of um, Walt Disney International, he says, but you've got everything, we've given you carte blanche. And my only answer to him was, I don't think I'm the right person to build on somebody else's vision. And I think when I said that, I wasn't really sure what I was saying, but I really meant that, that as an entrepreneur, one of the first DNAs is you want to build on your own vision. And here was a phenomenal company with a phenomenal brand, but I just didn't feel turned on that I could build on somebody else's vision or build the dream for Walt Disney India or Walt Disney Asia, as the case may be. So that was a telling moment for me. But the other part, just to finish off on what money meant. So Zarina actually taught it off and um, did a 10-day course with Teach for India. And she came back one fine day and said, that's it. I know what I'm doing for the next 10 years of my life. I'm going to join Teach for India. Uh, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't do that. We've worked together for a better part of our life. Now you can't go start working with somebody else. Um, and she said, no, but I want to do something in that space. And I said, look, we've got this very small um, not-for-profit that we have nurtured for the last 20 years. Um, so why don't we challenge ourselves and lift a million people out of poverty every five to six years? And I think that was one of my most expensive retention statements I've ever made for anybody in my life, to be able to hold on to somebody. But it was expensive talent, very precious talent, so I needed to do that. But all I'm saying is at various stages, when you have that sense of wealth creation, you figure out what you want to do next. And I don't think money drives the next level of, you know, why have you got this and why would you want to do that? I think the objectives are very different. Industrial response. So then, there's nothing hatch. 
school now. Uh, You've done some serious homework, I can see. No, you don't have any question mark. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you're in this set of uh, the business duty, uh, Bloomberg duty, which is uh, another part of uh, running businesses, building with things like you know, we have to continue to grow business in this way. Uh, so, the unity, uh, Bloomberg duty of business uh, has uh, running from the partners and the line of the And as part of the handover, we were, the, the line of the agency, the line of change has basically ensured that all the group CEOs of the Goes through a handover session with Wally at his uh, the agency. And while I'm not going to name specifics, uh, there was a certain CEO from that group who, uh, I, by that time, just to put in context, Wally was being a bit out of style as well as uh, the world was going to be competing. Uh, so here are two gentlemen who first came about that on a stage set of meetings and were continuously very, very adamant with Ruth in talking to Wally about the fact that uh, you are actually were a so much so that it upset me because I had to visit him the next day that day. And um, after the meeting finished, I walked up to Ravi and said, you know, Ravi, how did you get to talk to me like this? And I don't know Ravi, can you put out a glass of coffee? And of course, and my meeting was not only to last more than not more than three minutes. Okay, by the time coffee comes, I'm loud. So it's a little bit tough. But he then proceeded to tell me that, look, the same guys we are talking about, these are the same guys who are going to see the center guys to come home with the other. So I don't need to make a point to him. I don't know that we are talking like this. I just I'm conscious with the same set of people um, about the center of North and Lava. So um, how do you sort of manage to detach um, you know, your achievement from a certain, especially when you believe that somebody is talking down to you or being unfair to you? Well, on a more humorous note, and anecdotal is the nice way to always talk about it, but on a humorous note, I think in the media and entertainment business, when you deal with the kind of egos that you deal with, you kind of, you kind of get jaded over a certain period of time. And I think from the very early days of my life, uh, when I wanted to look at, especially when I decided media and entertainment was something that I wanted to look at, the role is either you're deeply involved in one aspect or you're a catalyst. And I think if you want to take a business role, you need to be a catalyst. And by that you mean you are actually looking at various people and then figuring out how you're going to work with the most creative people, the most difficult people, the most, um, what I would say, business-oriented people, and you know, on a global scale. So I think that was something that one was jaded. On a more serious note, I would say, if you have your sense of confidence and self-confidence, then actually everything else blurs. And that's maybe been my uh, learning and just my naturalness to that situation. Because if I feel, if, you've got your, if you're your own best critique, and if you have self-confidence in yourself, actually everything else will look quite fuzzy. Because you won't get that miffed, irritated, conflicted with somebody else that's getting into ego. Yeah. Yeah, because you're, you're not there to correct the other person. You don't know what the backdrop of those are. You don't know necessarily what that is. But if it starts affecting you, then I think that's a problem. So I think the more important part of that was, did it really affect me at that particular point in time, rather than ignoring or how was I tolerating it? And I think to me, yeah, I think a, a good mixture of my experience in handling and being a catalyst for the better part of my life when I was looking at media and entertainment and the ability to have own self-confidence and being your own self-critic has really done so this. This could perhaps look in that circumstance and which is also a Yeah. Let me give you another example and anecdote on on where I learned a valuable lesson on doing this. And this this experience is extremely personal because this is where I met Sunil Chandra when I was doing this. Um, and I remember that um, I was doing a green daily event by a house. Um, and I was doing events in Anand, Bhutsa, Jaipur, Bhutsal, uh, and also Kapra Pradesh. I actually, I think, decided to go for a shopping event. And I think I think Anand Sunil said that when he came, he said, when you meet the guy, Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah. The fact that you know you look at a prospect for the cause and we don't have a short term cash for example. Um, why do you feel a need to do this if somebody who's already playing hard to get? It's culture setting. I think that defines the culture. Different people have different cultures. I think over a period of time in a working relationship, if I expected you to be extremely open and blunt with me. Because I was never going to be not blunt and open with you, and I mean that in a first person or with anybody else. Uh, then you just establish the culture right away, right? And I think it stuck with you enough to know that the next time we would have a serious conversation or anything else, my message to you wouldn't be personal. It would be substantially third person and objective. So to me, that's culture. Uh, and if you're, I mean, the most important thing about culture is lead from the front, right? Otherwise, it's not culture in the first place. You can have a glass mirror at the reception are defining your mission or your culture, but if you're not leading from the front and practicing it, and if you don't believe in it, that's difficult. So my simple answer to that is, that was just the culture that I think we set and grew in our various companies in very diversified ways. And it was a representation of that. I don't think I was more desperate or less, I wouldn't have been, I mean, if there was somebody in that sense, it was not, not for, for reasons of anything else, but that you should feel that, wow, I had a complete interview. And frankly, as you said, you were doing well in Viacom. So I, I needed to convince you to join what would be a struggling startup and a pretty tough environment. So you needed to feel, for these reasons, my learning curve may be even better. Because I think people join companies and stay with companies to be inspired, to learn, to grow. Yes, also to earn. But I think these three play a very important role. I think in a more general sense, in a more learning sense, I think, you know, as, as leaders and or as entrepreneurs, I think you have to first get used to the fact that you're going to have to take bolder and bolder decisions, and maybe with less and less information at your disposal from time to time. And I can't tell you that I think it's much more relevant today in the 21st century. Uh, uh, just anecdotally, at Upgrad, um, I have three co-founders. All three of them come from consultancy. And my wife brought this up to me in a very sharp manner, where she said, uh, but that's chalk and cheese, right? Because all the consultants want to do is they need to have maximum amount of information to possibly take a decision. And you're going to take the minimum amount of information to come to your decision. And that's, that's that chalk and cheese question. So I think one is you have to go with your impulse. The very fact that one, had, one was going to take on CNBC means we needed a brand. Outside of Bloomberg, there wasn't a third brand in the, in the world. The only other brand was ABC Business News, and we had actually done that, and it didn't move the needle for us. So I had a, 
uh, uh, already a learning lesson there. So for me, actually, convincing and going out there was the first part. There was a backstory that for a year, one had, one had developed a relationship, but I hadn't connected with them in a long manner. And I felt this was the time to really move and make that face-to-face -face connect with people. Um, I think for me, therefore, knowing full well, getting on the flight and thinking through that 14 hours to figure out what one needed to say and do that would make them feel that not today, maybe Pranoy and NDTV would make a better partner, but in the three-year or five-year period, why would Ronnie and UTV and whatever else? And I have to say that one of the things I did was actually get people from the West Coast of America to call the people on the East Coast, because Bloomberg was in New York. And it helped that I had partnered with News Corp and Fox, and, I had, and Disney was a shareholder. So my first impulse getting on a plane at the airport was, I'm getting on a plane, would you be able to, I'm going to be on a plane for 14 hours, can you talk to these people and just give them a reference check on me as to why we've had a great relationship and a partnership for the last five to seven years. So when you start that context, and it's already laid there before you come for a meeting, I think that was the homework that I could do in that very short period of time. And then secondly is talking vision. You know, I think again as leaders, one of our things is to build perception. And that doesn't mean that it needs to be soft, but I think building perception and giving that story and that anecdote is very, very critical and important. And I think, yeah, I, the last part I would say is I walked into that meeting quite clear that I didn't have a choice of walking out empty-handed. Because then I felt we'd have been out of the race. Because CNBC was already taken, and if Bloomberg was taken, personally to me, that would have been a huge setback. So when you go into something with a, I've got no choice, and somehow or the other, you don't have a plan B. And then you just focus on planning. You know, in some ways, I would say entrepreneurship overall, other than the fact that in the last two to three years, there's been a fair amount of evangelism for entrepreneurship in the country. A, because our prime minister has been talking about startup India. So at least in the smaller towns, I can see parents and families waking up and seeing, well, if the prime minister is talking about startup India and entrepreneurship, it couldn't be that bad. Because in my area, I think when you wanted to be an entrepreneur, it was almost like everyone looked at you thinking, so you can't get yourself a job, right? So obviously then you have to start working for yourself because nobody else is hiring you. I think that's evolved over a period of time. And then you've got some glamorous East Coast um, investors that have put a lot of money into India so that we can spend money on marketing and advertising and give it back to the West Coast um, um, tech companies like Facebook, Google, and whatever else. So that circle of life has got completed. But because of that, there have been some nice exits and a lot of value creation and a lot of noise. Uh, and that's given entrepreneurship a feeling and a halo, which I think is a double-edged sword, because I think it's a cup that's half full and a dangerous cup that's half empty. I don't think India has that resilience that if four or five of our big stories fall flat, you know, this whole entrepreneurial ecosystem can collapse in perception. Um, but I think today that's given a sense of confidence to a lot of people. But I think it's also created a, a thresholds that are not that acceptable. I mean, for me, I think when I started off, there was no concept of private equity, venture capital, debt, nothing. So when you had to start a business on your own at that particular stage, where there was no concept of even angels, uh, you would need to think of B2B approach to become a B2C company. You would need to start thinking that how do I start something which is going to give me positive cash flow at a particular stage. But I think today, the entitlement that entrepreneurs feel that, wait a minute, I got a great idea. Firstly, and then they pause, like the whole world should be listening to that great idea. But actually, you know, the nine other people are already having that exact same great idea and maybe a better execution plan. So then after that pause, and then they feel, yeah, but I can't do it because I haven't got the funding. So it's almost become a sense of entitlement. And I think that part is a, is a dangerous evaluation for, for, for the Indian ecosystem. No, I don't think it's that easily available because what we read about in your publications and newspapers are the ones that actually paint the picture. But for that, there's a whole bottom of the pyramid that doesn't get it and does, doesn't get it at all. But I think it's that it's, it's because it's become an entitlement, 
because that's what you read in the media, that's what you feel. The badge of honor is not your business. The badge of honor is I've arrived if I've raised funding. Whereas, you know, 20 years back, I think the difference was you've arrived when you've built a business. Moving out. So, I mean, one is inflection points, the second one is exits. Yeah. So, you're talking more about Both the decision. To the inflection point or right time to exit. Well, just in terms of inflection points, I think from a young age, I have been obsessed with scale. Because I think in India, price point is always a challenge. Digging and making a market is always a challenge. But I think if you're looking at scale, then you might get somewhere. In almost everything that one has done, I think that's important. But I think today, we kind of accept glass ceilings uh, very easily. I mean, yes, you know, for me, a glass ceiling for all of us here would mean, that's why it's called a glass ceiling, right? Because that means you've got to break it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be glass. It would be a cement ceiling. And I think when you reach that glass ceiling, the normal instinct for people here in business is to diversify. Because you reach that glass ceiling, then you think, oh, the market's not big enough. Did I underestimate that? And then you start self-convincing yourself that maybe this is, I'm three years before my time, or I'm five years before my time, so let me look at some other things. So you're doing two wrong things right there and then, right? You're, you're not breaking the glass ceiling and continuing the tougher part of what you set out to do. And the second one is you're diversifying, which in itself means over a period of time, your attention, focus, resources, manpower, money is all going to go in a different direction. So I think if you identify those two parts, in me, and I'm saying this with learnings, because if I had one big advice that I would have got in my early years, uh, which I think today I missed out on, was focus. You know, and I think as an entrepreneur, you start looking at things, and you look at things in opportunities. And I think everyone is very opportunistic when you're young and even whenever else. So opportunities is good, but if it doesn't lack the focus, I think today the values that has been created with the ones that are building skyscrapers versus the ones that are building conglomerates, um, one or two exceptions notwithstanding, um, I think are, are, are pretty important. So that to me is how I define inflection points. Exits. Yeah, so let's, I mean, exits for a lot of people here, all I would say very clearly is you can't plan an exit. I, I don't think you can ever plan an exit. The problem is, by the way, also that if you are in exit mode, the probability of getting one, more than one third of the value of your business is going to be low. Because if you're in exit mode, then the buyer knows you're in exit mode. So firstly, I don't think you can plan an exit. Second, I think if you are in exit mode, then you're already depreciated your value. But I think, you know, I, I started a cable TV business, but I, it peaked at the end of five years, and then regulations became so mired in this country that I felt I wanted to leave it, because I just didn't feel we could work it in a legitimate manner. So when the CEO that I had appointed came and told me, for example, that look, I'm joining a group, Sterling Group in Chennai, uh, and they want me to start the cable TV business in India. And just my utterance to him was, well, do you think you want to buy what you've got here and take that there and do that? And one thing led to another, and then, you know, 45 days later, they'd given us a term sheet for buying it because they were anyway wanted to start it, and here I was saying, take it. Yeah. Now, that's 50% serendipity, and friend, you know, and I think that's what it is. Much later, when I think I sold, uh, built toothbrushes and sold that business, to me, that was a compulsion because I was a first-generation entrepreneur, didn't have any money. Um, Murdoch and News Corp had invested and bought 49% into UTV at that particular point in time, and it wasn't really strategic. Because they had come in, then they had their problems with uh, ZTV and Subhash Chandra. So essentially, there wasn't a strategic reason why they invested in UTV. So for the next six, seven years, we carried on doing what we want to do, but there was nothing strategic. So when I wanted to list the company, the first thing I wanted to do is buy back their shareholding. So I had to sell my toothbrush business to actually feel that I wanted to focus on one. My dad, of course, didn't agree with that because he still wanted me to take, sell the toothbrush business and buy Tata shares and not necessarily continue to do that with UTV. But if you take the story on further, 
when we built Hangama as a TV channel and then wanted to, we didn't want to sell it. We didn't build it to sell it. But Disney approached us and said, hey, you've got the number one kids channel and we want to buy it. And we said, but why would we want to sell it? But one thing led to another and 15 days later, they came back with a proposal of a value that we thought was not uh, you know, uncomplimentary for what we had done in 18 months. But most important, that they wanted to invest 14% into UTV. So for the first time, I felt, wow, I'm getting a global brand and this is the story. So then we let go of that channel and we broadened the picture. And lastly, at the end of the day, if you look at when I was exiting media totally, again, that was not a thought process that originated from me. It wasn't one fine day I said, I'm done with media and entertainment. If somebody would have asked me 15 days before that, I would have said, what are you talking about? But I think they used to sit on our board and I, because they had Disney India, I used to spend a lot of time with them. And we'd always be talking about their plans and our plans in the country. The more we talked about it, one fine day when we were having dinner, everyone said, look, this is all common. Why don't we just put it all together? And I said, yeah, really? And then I left it because I don't know what that means, put it all together. And I just left it there. And they came back and made a proposal, and then we moved forward. But to me, the reason for saying was that we had about 1,300 people. I think they were proud of having a UTV visiting card. But if they had a Disney UTV visiting card, they would have felt even better. Um, Having worked on a brand, to be able to pass it on to a 10x, 100x bigger brand made complete and eminent sense. Did I have any clear reason as to what I was going to do the next day after I exited the company? Not at all. But at that time, it just felt right. For the next one year, I would say everyone you know, uh, slam dunked us. This is like, how, because I think exit has only been a good word in the last three years in the Indio ecosystem. I think before that, people would look at exit as abandonment. So it was like for a whole full year, it was like, how can you abandon the company that you built? I don't get it. Why, why would you do that? You know, and I think now in retrospect, I think the exit world has evolved. It's a strategy, yeah. And I think you started the, the, the session with talking about arrogance. Yeah. But I'm saying, to me, that's arrogance. And I think it's a telltale sign. I wasn't selling to somebody. If I was selling, if I'm selling a, buying a flat and selling a flat to somebody, I don't need to have a deep history to figure out you know, what, what, you know, who's, who's going to live in the place after that. So to this, when you're having a partnership, if you haven't sorted out mutual respect, the probability of it breaking down is, is high. Therefore, the probability of it not working from day one is very high. Because if there isn't mutual respect and trust, and I think that does happen, that does, I'm not saying it in a very, uh, in, the, in the most uh, complimentary manner, but I do believe that, you know, especially when it comes to American companies and whatever else, sometimes they have that. And even when we were working with uh, News Corp and Disney and whatever else, I would always tell my people, after 7.30, 8 p.m., you don't need to get on a call, okay? Figure out a way in which it's a complimentary just so that the colleagues that they were dealing on the other side would not necessarily feel their superior, and somebody here was not, not superior. And this was, part of, and this was something I'd be very open on the other side too, saying, guys, would you do the call at 11 p.m.? To me, that's symbolic. It was a small thing, but I think it's a huge thing, because if you don't have mutual respect and trust, uh, more respect, probability is you're, you're going to be uh, step 
step treated across the board. So no regrets as far as that is concerned. No, 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 no. I think they they panicked. They panicked. Yeah, yeah. They did panic, and I got a lot of lot of. They they told me they all went out for a drink after I said no to that one. I don't drink, so they didn't take me along. <laughs> anyway, they wouldn't have helped because they were. They were I don't think they were going to convince me. I was quite clear about that. Um, and look, I genuinely felt at that particular stage in time that it's not going to be a working relationship. And I think it's a very important learning lesson for all of us. And it doesn't have to happen because it's an American company on a time zone. I think it, that early reading of mutual respect, especially in a partnership, is very important. No, but I think part of the honeymoon period is to focus on the benefits. But then that's why it's called the honeymoon period. <laughs> Swan song yes. as a value creation swan song, I think. Yeah. Well, look, I think in 2012, um, my first task was to combine the consolidate the companies and make them grow. I had an option to stay on for five years. I stayed on for one, and I already said why because I, I just felt as an entrepreneur I couldn't implement somebody else's vision. But it was a very cool and calm transient. During that one year, obviously I couldn't do much, um, and so the first time I realized what wealth management is about. And I had a few people come in there, no disrespect for everyone here. But by the third meeting with somebody, I was kind of falling asleep, thinking now, I mean, what am I going to do with mutual fund and this and have this discussion and whatever else? And what is this wealth? I didn't quite understand that. And somebody would come and say, form a trust. I said, well, why would I want to form a trust? If I've already got one daughter. I don't need to have a complicated structure. No, no, no. If you've got wealth, you've got to form a trust. So anyway, I passed that moment. And I realized that actually I'm a doer. But those meetings gave me a very clear realization that even if I wanted to start all over again, I wanted to be a doer. I was not somebody who wanted to just be an investor. I did make during that year uh, a lot of private equity investments, uh, and some of them have worked out pretty well. But at the, really at the end of that 10-day break that I took to New Zealand and came back, I was very clear that I wanted to start something, and I wanted to get my hands dirty, and I wanted to get the f fun and feel of starting all over again with two or three preconditions. One of them was I wasn't going to travel more than 10 minutes from my home because I had done that for 25 years in my life. Where I, you, know, you travel one hour, 15 minutes from Breach Candy to Andheri and one hour, 45 minutes when you come back in the evening, regardless of whatever, whatever time you come. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm saying that was my one precondition. I'm not going to move more than 10 minutes. I have to earn some rights in that thought process. Um, and I think the second one was I didn't want to run a company and I didn't want to take the challenge of HR and the building of people. I just felt over a period of time that that sucks you up in a very clear manner. So I just felt I didn't want to run a company, um, but I wanted to be an executive chairman, but I wanted to do something. So with these two very clear guidelines, the first one, of course, was just semantic. So it get, that gets, yeah, but what I'm saying is that's solvable, right, at, at, at that particular stage. So for me, understanding a sector that I wanted to spend the next 10, 15 years of my life with was important. And finding co-founders was the most important part. Because obviously, if I don't want to run it, then I've got to find co-founders. And the first thing, if you're getting into ed tech, tech or anything to do with tech, your first criterion is you're going to find people half your age, literally half your age in that sense. Um, but therefore comes the other challenges of how do you deal with co-founders where everyone feels completely free and open to do what we wanted to do. And I think to me, between two or three sectors that I was looking at, education came naturally to me. I think my learning in my first innings was more where I understood building a brand uh, and building credibility, but building a brand, which is quite important. It takes a lot of time. People think a marketing campaign is building a brand. I think we all understand it's not. The second one is understanding consumers. I think what media taught me for 15 years was understanding trends and understanding consumers in the deepest of manner. So that was another strength for me. 
Third, I think, was my obsession for scale. And I think fourth would be my ability to be able to bring great partnerships to bear and being a great catalyst. So if I wrote down those four as my strengths, and I think anyone who's moving needs to understand what your strengths are. Of course, you need to understand your weaknesses. I felt the education sector lent and had tick marks to all of that. I think the turning point for me was also that when I look at the education sector at the end of the day, and I don't want to be flippant about it, it is storytelling. At the core, if you're teaching at any stage, whether it's in school, whether it's in tuitions, whether it's in college, and definitely when it's in, in, in after working professional life, at the end of the day, I mean, if you ask a Harvard student today what is the most memorable thing about doing a course, he'll say the case studies. To me, that's storytelling, right? It's basically understanding. So if you look at that, how do you bring teaching and education to be so engaging that it's almost anecdotal? I think if I start rattling out the five E's or the six C's of something, everyone's going to start looking at their phones. But we're having a nice conversation here in a very intimate surrounding, and we're sharing anecdotes. You're sharing some of your experiences, I'm sharing some of mine, and hopefully when we do questions. But that's engaging to the best way it can be. And I think, therefore, my, my sense and strength to feel that education in this country needs to change in a manner in which... Uh, you know, what do I can, what can I do to disrupt it in that space was pretty much it, which is my non-linear thinking mantra of anything that I want to do. And so upgrade for me is in the post-graduation space, because I think the challenges that we feel face overall in education, and you know, you're, you're running a really large and very successful unit yourselves, is whatever we do, we all have to collectively do something to change together, because I think that's at the fundamental root of change. It is, it is a huge time bomb. I think we can be, be definitely can and will be a five trillion economy, but I think at the core of it, I feel very blessed that I'm working very deeply and very actively and very hands-on with two sectors. One is in the education space, and I think the second one is in the rural uh, and not-for-profit space. Because I think the other part is, as long as we have 600 million challenges are among us. And there again, as an execution foundation for this, I think we experience that. That change is not happening. And if I can just extend on that point, um, I think we're doing a lot when we're working with a, and I don't want to bore you with the, with the model of Swades, which is something that we're looking at. Exactly what I did is my retention strategy with my wife and said, why do we miss, uh, lift a million people out of poverty? But I think uh, one of our first donors, the first two, three years, our model is really to look at a concentric geography of about a million people and make a permanent change. And there, my first thing was, we want to exit a geography every six to seven years. I realized within four weeks that if I use the word exit in the social space, everyone's going to really biff me. So we changed that word to empowerment, because that just sounds like you're going to abandon me and walk away. And they've been abandoned for the last 70 years, according to them, in any case, with promises and false promises. So notwithstanding the actual model of, 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 of Swades, I think the real change that one would bring about is going to be very, very critical for what we really want to do. And I think, to me, therefore, when I look at that anecdote, it's quite, it's quite a strong one. I think the good part is that we're an execution foundation. There again, I think for my wife, she spends 100% of her time, I spend 30% of my time <laughs> on Swadesh. We have 300 full-time people working for us. But one of the first things we did when we wanted to scale up was we spent about a year just meeting nonprofit organizations across India. Our maximum, our maximum inspiration, I think, came from an organization in Bangladesh called BRAC, if anyone's heard of it. A lot of you all have heard of, what have heard of Nobel Prize winner Professor Yunus, who runs the Grameen Bank. But actually, bigger than that, as far as I'm concerned, is BRAC. I think they constitute about BRAC. And yeah, Professor Faisal, very, very charming. Person. I think the first time my wife ever offered to take a selfie, asked someone, can I take a selfie, was you, was with, with, uh, with, uh, with him, Professor Faisal. Uh, and that's after with us dealing with all the celebrities of the world put together. 
Um, but I think what we realized was three, four things. One, all the problems are interconnected. They're very, very interconnected. So I know the first thing for the first two and a half to three years, people told us, you got to work in a silo. Focus on education, or focus on water, or focus on sanitation. And we took the very tough route of taking a 360 degree model, because if you want to make a permanent change and exit a geography, it's all interconnected. So health, education, and most of all, the holy grail for us is livelihood. So when we look at our geography, we wanted to be a hands-on execution foundation, and we wanted to make a permanent change. So we look at our entire Raigad geography, where we're working seven blocks, as a GDP, where I think we're at about a 45 crore GDP, and how do we take that six blocks to a 200 crore GDP over six to seven years, and what do we need to do? And when you look at the social sector like that, it's phenomenal. But the last point I wanted to make was that for the first two, three years, we had no buyers. Buyers as in donors that bought into our story, and we were funding it completely on our own. And the outlays are pretty large every, every year. And the first donor we had was Mr. Tata. Um, you know, and we were quite, we were talking to him and whatever else in Tata Trust. And then he kind of spent some time in our geography. And the first thing he said is, sir, you know, Ronnie, I think I've noticed this a lot. You all have been able to change aspiration levels in rural India. In your villages, the f only thing I noticed that I thought was good, yeah, you've done some good work in water, everyone's got a toilet. But I felt aspiration levels have moved because of that. And the reason I'm saying that, I think one of the key problems in India is rural India doesn't have an aspiration. If I sit with them and say, you've got four acres of land, and I will give you drip irrigation, and I will be able to give you multi-crop solutions, and you can start earning two and a half lakhs rupees in your household over a period of one year from the 50,000 per annum, 90% of them don't understand what that means. What does financial inclusion mean? What does it mean that I can actually have two lakhs more? Why should I be in control of my own destiny? Will that mean that the government will abandon me because now I've become self-sufficient? Okay. And actually, no, I want to do it over half an acre. I'll try it, and over the next five years, maybe I'll do it over my one acre. And that's when we realized that we can make whatever targets we want as a not-for-profit, but when you're working with communities on the other side, your targets are really relevant. And for the first two years, we failed miserably, because here we were pushing targets on people where they felt, okay, if you want to come and drip irrigate, do it, and then they wouldn't do anything about it. So I think aspiration levels is a huge challenge for us in this country, and we should not take that for granted. So I think it, it dawned on me when I was starting all over again in 2013-14 and starting to build a business, uh, one in the not-for-profit and one in the for-profit, Upgrad being the for-profit in this one, um, that at the core, I still find in India, and we talked a little bit about earlier days in entrepreneurship, is what is the risk-taking ability? And about 90% of the people I still talk to, when we talk in context, we always talk with the precedents. Okay, but we set a wrong precedent. Okay, this is what, how we were doing it. And I think even at this stage today, even when I'm talking to people half my age, I think the frustration I feel with them is everyone's talking about, okay, but that's how it gets done, and that's how we used to do it. So to me, the pre-definition of nonlinear thinking means you, the past is not as relevant as we think it is. Of course, learning lessons, but past is not as relevant as it is. And two, we need to take risks. Because what is the risk we're taking? We're not taking sufficient risks. But if you do these two, the outcome will be exponential. So I think if you can apply that to whatever you're thinking through, your possibility of building long-term uh, businesses and being able to multitask is going to be quite. And I feel in the rural space, if I hadn't got that and I wasn't obsessed with it, I don't think we'd have stuck it out. Because the challenges that you solve uh, when you're working in the not-for-profit space, I think are 10x of what you're doing in your normal for-profit space. And one of the big things you need to learn is patience. Because I can have a one-hour review meeting uh, when you're running a P&L center with your people in a for-profit, and then two hours later, you're having a not-for-profit discussion with your division heads, and you're saying, okay, what about targets, and how, much, how many households have we put two taps of water in, 
where's the livelihood index on this? And then somebody stops and gives you a whole nine minute anecdote about how, because this tap was not done, this girl stepped out, and she got bitten by a snake, and this is what we did, and so on and so on. And you want to listen to that. Because that's not the time you say, well, wait, 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 let's, let's get down to the target. Right. So there's an entire, there's an entire different cross learning yeah, that yeah. I think has been, that's why I think it, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, it's fascinating. I think our, our experiences of urban India don't even prepare us one iota for the life. I mean, it's a different country, pretty much. Yeah. And I think. And there again, like we had a 10 minute um, from home uh, index for here. I think whatever we're doing. Yeah. We're now in the Raigad district, and we're now going to the Nasik district. But I think the idea was anything that's not more than four hours driving distance for us, because we want to get there and yeah. sit with the community for a fair period. So Zaina travels at least two, three times a month. I do at least once a month. Great. Um, this, this has been really, really interesting and, and, and fascinating for me. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. But I know that Ronnie hates these one-on-one -on -one sort of conversations. This perhaps would be the longest time we've spent chatting, <laughs> chatting with each other. Uh, so true. Ronnie's style, I think uh, he'd love to sort of do an interaction with all of you. Now, there's a mic on all of your tables. Feel free to ask him any, any sort of questions that you have. Um, and I'm sure happy to sort of uh, share his thoughts on that with you. That's the nice part about a cozy, cozy setup of, you know, five tables. Yeah, I think that's very much. Yeah, I know. Okay, so another good session. I know you did it in Tech Mind uh, Hyderabad, right? In April. So all this is fine. I wanted to understand, you know, you're shifting your focus from one business to other. And you talked about the diversity now, doing an NGO versus a profit making businesses. How do you plan? And I know you said you said don't plan exit. But how do you, at what stage do you plan a diversification or a defocus? I think it's pretty much the middle where you, you can't stop, nor can you have all the answers. So you're, you're moving ahead, but you have a pretty really good reason. I think in, you know, in my first innings, I would say I was a lot more impulsive. And I think today, because one, is, one has got that guidance. But in every aspect of what you're doing, I personally am a strong believer that serendipity plays a big role. So you figured out something, and then you want to move forward. Did I have a final reason as to why I wanted to exit the media and entertainment business? No. But Things came about, it was an opportunity, a hard call, and you have to take it one way or the other. When I started to do education, if I had to figure out all the tick lists of why I want to enter this space and build something at massive and valuable scale, um, it would take me three, four years. I would have hired four uh, consultants who would have told me exactly what I knew, but in a very concise manner that I could read for 15 minutes. But sometimes your notes are even better. So my simple answer is, um, you have to plan as you go along. There's, there's, there's no shortcut necessarily to that, if you really want to move forward. And I think, but you need to understand your strengths and what you bring to the table and why you're doing what you're doing. So I think for me, in the last five years, my learning of why has been as important of, as to what I'm doing. And I don't mean it in just jargon, but why we want to do something in the not-for-profit and why we want to do something in education versus a business. And why do we feel and you know, outside of that, I can give you the fact that you know, my five-year non-compete finished. But I just felt instinctively the end of five years. I didn't miss media and entertainment for five years at all. A lot of people ask me, but it's such a glamorous business. Don't you miss it? I said, no, I miss the people, but I don't think I miss the business. And at the end of five years, I kind of felt that storytelling in India is changing. Today, I think the grammar, basically because of digital platforms or whatever else. So at the end of five years, I just got excited and said, now I'll look at this not as a business, but as a hobby. And the minute my definition for hobby comes about, so today if I'm looking at just creating movies, my ability to say no is actually a very powerful thing when you're looking at what you're also choosing to do. So the way everyone said, nah, it's a hobby, but you're already doing six movies a year. How can anyone call it a hobby? And I'm saying the hobby for me is two, three reasons. One is I, I have the ability to say no, because in, when you're running your own business, at least 50% of the decisions you take, you have to. And the other 50%, you want to. But I think when you're running something which is a passion and a hobby, if it's not 100% of what you want to do, you want to do, then you're not in the right direction. So I think those were some of my guiding posts for what, what 
drives me to, with clarity to quite an extent to what I do. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> I have two questions. Uh, one, how do you measure impact in the social development space? I mean, for, as corporate India, I mean, all we do is look at bottom line and look at the EBITDA numbers and the multiples and valuations. It's easy to get carried away. Yeah. Impact is something which is very, very critical. How yeah. do you do that? And two, on the lighter side, but more important from the human development aspect, you have worked with people who are always 18 or 20. I mean, whether in the glamour industry, they never age. Uh, they're always 18 or 20. And you're actually working with millennials who are actually 21 and uh, having greater ideas or execution plans. What has changed? I mean, what's the 21st century India youth looking like? OK, so just on your first question, it's a very important one. And I think that was our learning for the first one year. When we wanted to meet NGOs, the first thing I did actually is I identified about the eight or nine people doing incredible work for water, for example, and sanitation. And we called them up. I wrote to them. I called them and said, can we come to Bombay and can we do a one-day conference? And the first question everyone asks is, but who else is coming? And I'm saying, but this is the nonprofit sector. Why would you care who else is coming? We want to come there. So there's a fair amount of competitiveness even there. But when we met a lot of people, and the reason we wanted to do an execution foundation versus cutting a check with NGOs, we could have easily gone into a geography, identified nine smaller NGOs, and just cut checks for them, was exactly this, that I think our ability to measure impact in this country is still very low. So I think we spend at least 20 to 25% of our time on measuring impact. So one is, a, for that you need a baseline. So today I think one of the challenges from census to anything else, our baseline is still very weak in this country for any facts. Even when we're talking about market reports and market research here, everyone's quoting uh, the big four or a consultancy firm's report. But I think we all have been interviewed by those people who then go meet 50 people to come up with their report. So it's a kind of a round circle when you come to the whole situation of how, what's the accuracy of that. Uh, to answer your question directly, when it comes to infrastructure, things like water and sanitation, it's a little bit easier because our objective was two taps in each home across all our homes, 2,200 villages, 1,20,000 households. The question was, when you measure impact is, if you consume more than 200 liters of water a day, for example, in each of those households, um, the probability of your spring or your source of water where you've got it from is going to dry up within four to five years versus 10 to 15 years. So to us, just understanding that and then figuring out how we were going to keep those benchmarks and by forming water committees and then figuring out what we needed to do was equally important. And just to not beleaguer on that, when I said we wanted to put two taps in each home, even all our team members went completely mad because they said that's 25% more cost versus the stand post, which is where everyone would come. And everyone said they'll consume more water if there's a two tap in the home. And I can tell you today, right now, with our experience, they're consuming less water once they feel liberated and they feel empowered in that context that it's their own. The biggest thing to create, uh, to measure impact on is in education. So I think for the first four years, we did some incredible amount of work, opened a library in each of our 1,200 schools with a phenomenal partner called Rooms to Read, um, did interference in almost every single aspect. To me, the library on one end and career counseling on the other were the two, what I was most proud of, because I think we all take for granted when people ask you, what do you want to do when you grow up? But find out in rural India by asking somebody, what do you want to do when you grow up? Their parents haven't ever asked them, asked them that question. So we thought we'd done an incredible amount. At the end of three years, we did a report, and we hadn't moved the needle at all. We did a report in the fourth year, and our heart sank, thinking, my god, do we really think we want to do? Now, the person who came and said, look, I just want to tell you, I know it's a tough one. It takes eight years in education to move the needle. By the sixth year of what we're doing in many aspects, we're actually seeing. But impact measurement is now very doable. I think the Gates Foundation is an is a exemplary uh, uh, benchmark for they won't spend money, and they'll spend 10% of their money actually on spending money to impact measure. But I think that's very important. Uh, I think the government could even do that to a certain extent, it would be a phenomenal input for them. Even if they spend 2% on impact measurement, they can save 20% of their cost. And sorry, your second question was, in a nutshell? The millennials. Sorry? Yeah, millennials. The millennials. I mean, what do you see the, the, today's youth? I mean, you worked with the glamour industry as well as the startups. It's wild. That thought process is wild. I mean, I, I think we should just be all very clear here. Um, I mean, they're wired differently. 
Nonlinear is not something that would even be a concept. It would be much more complicated and much, it's a different, different, it's, it's, a, it's a very different wiring. I think we need to understand that, that if you're trying to solve it and trying to figure out that, I think their, their trend, their thinking, their ability, their freedom to, their sense of feeling liberated is very, very, very powerful. Uh, and it is wired. It's a very different wiring. And once you understand that, actually there's a lot of opportunity that you can do there. Um, and I think today why you're finding every two or three or four years that the next revolution of even technology or communication or content is changing is because they're in charge as you go forward. So I think any young, any organization not having 20 to 25 percent of their uh, core group of people less than 25 years old is already starting to feel extinct, whether we like it or not. The problem with them is they have different codes of life. So you may want to bring in discipline, but you might be knocking on the wrong door. Because if they're wired differently, and if their priorities are that, the idea is, it's like a big company acquiring a small company, and then you want to put that culture in there. You know that that merger and acquisition is going nowhere. So I think the same way if you're adopting millenniums or you're adopting uh, you know, Generation Z or whichever way you want to call them, I think we need to understand that then we need to create an environment where they will prosper and foster rather than anything else. Good evening, Mr. Roni. Um, I had a question regarding your um, tougher times or your failures and what are some of the lessons that you can share with during your challenging times, something that we can all learn from? Challenging times, sorry. Uh, lesson when you are facing tough times. Or failures, you know. I mean, we spoke a lot about your success, but I'm sure you had... No, no, t absolutely tons of them. I want to tell you that the CV that I wrote out here, and I remember about four years back, my daughter was introducing me to some talk and I was feeling most embarrassed because then she went on and on about and I, that's when I realized that I think we're all making a huge, huge mistake when we write our CVs about what we do. I think we should all record only our failures. So, and I think yeah, nobody took me up on that and uh, but seriously I really, really, really mean that and just not being facetious. So I mean definitely I think the, 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 the context of, I mean in media and entertainment, when you're running that, I want to first tell you that your failures are in the public eye. Every failure is at the, in the public eye from that perspective. So it's huge in terms of its benchmark. Um, but I think as an entrepreneur, you faced existential questions in, in the first five years of your life, and you've got to deal with them. But I think um, if I had any learnings to deal with in my first 10 years, 15 years of my failures versus now what I deal with failures, it would be slightly different, and I think for me, actual direct communication with the people that you work with was a very important learning for me. That you, whatever it is, if you're not going to say it out, the, the amount of people that will come and support you if you tell them exactly what it is, whether it's your staff or it's your banker and most important, your creditor, if you level with them, I just found it to be. And the second one is, I think we have a tendency to not alarm everybody and therefore we give our bad news in dribs and drabs. And that's even more scary, because once you say it once, then you say something else, and you think you're giving it in healthy doses, but then nobody knows how many more of those doses are going to come about. So being able to put it all up front, bold as it may be, difficult as it may be, was one. I felt actually humor plays a big role when you're having a tough time, tough as it may be, but then that's what leadership is about. Because I think if you're sharing problems, but if you can, if you can just bring about a certain sense of lightness, it breaks the ice in a very, very different manner. And third, I think my particular motto has always been, if the options were that, and I think that's what I have a disconnect with a lot of entrepreneurs today who feel they're giving themselves timelines. They say, no, I'm trying this out for two years. And I've met a lot of people from professionals who also feel, yeah, I'm at my 40, I want to do this, I really want to do this now, I've got a choice. But I thought now at this stage, I should give this a chance for two to three years. And I keep saying, if you're giving it a chance for two to three years, I would urge you, don't do it. Because you can't time success and you can't time failure. I think if there's one reason that I'm sitting here is because I stuck it out. Not because I faced a lot of successes. I think I faced more failures than I failed to take successes. But I stuck it out. And the law of averages when you stick it out is huge. Rani, quick question to you, that you moved from 
you said wealth creation was an objective to now you are changing the social sector so question is that is it that only after you have wealth people start doing from things from goodness of their heart because india really needs transformation in the social sector and if we are going to wait for everybody to get get wealth and then think that we so there is something missing there so that is i wanted your perspective on that second question not related to this is are you seeing any change in the age of the founders because i am thinking i am sitting here i think i am like i agree with deepak i am thinking of retirement i am not thinking of <laughs> setting something up so is there something you know any perspective on that yeah so to your first question the answer is a big flat uh, no i don't think anyone should look at any aspect uh, of giving back or doing any change in the social on the basis of when, when you have it firstly i think the sweat equity in india for social work is incredible having been through this for the last 6 7 years and met a lot of people a lot of people don't cut checks but they do a lot of work so i don't think uh, there should ever be a context i think when we started the foundation which is called the swadesh foundation now at that time it was called share it started in 1990 okay we didn't have profits as i said we were still figuring out how to get money for our but at that stage it happened because we said 10% of whatever we wanted to do we would give to charity you know maybe it was our, our parsi upbringing or i don't know what it was i can't somebody tell me what got me there i have no idea it's just one of those things so the first time we rented a 10000 square foot office 1000 of that we started a creche in an old age home in this 10000 square foot office in andheri but the 30 people who joined us the culture got formed because all 30 of them owned this more than they even owned the company that we were starting but at that stage i don't think it was a question of whether we had it or not and our first investor ever that came in was warburg pinkus and i remember dalip patrick sat on our board and the first thing he said i read this clause that you said that 10% of your profits are going to go to this what the hell is going on here kind of situation so i said no 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 he said but what about the years in which you don't make profits so i said well i'm an entrepreneur i'll figure that out in the years in which i don't but the aspect of that ownership at that particular point in time was not about when you find the solution but when you know from that perspective where do you go so i think the combination of being an entrepreneur simple answer is no and my best example for myself is my daughter she you know she studied in the us obviously the best thing that you can do for your kids is to give them the right education and then definitely leave them alone and not <laughs> guaranteeing them success by coming and joining you or doing like don't worry if you do this for sure because there's no such thing as for sure uh, and then she came back did what she wanted to do for that one year for what she had trained and came in one fine day and said i'm not happy i want to start something not for profit so i said ah okay come back and why don't you work in the swadesh foundation she said no i'm not working with you but if you look at the younger generation today their sense of entitlement is high but their sense of wanting to be involved and much more aware is much higher is very much higher and i feel already they are looking at in ways in which they want to do that and the last thing i would say in this whole space for philanthropy because i think the definition is really a 20th century definition and not a 21st century because we think of philanthropy as giving up money whereas actually if we give time i think the more impact outside of the money we're putting into swadesh is our time because i the, the solutions that i talked about here right now and some of the things in the social sector would not be there if we were cutting a check because i would never be close to the problem i wouldn't find a solution i would tell you 5 5 rupees out of the 10 rupees i was putting into the social space would be in uh, would be not impactful so i think that's my clear answer to that and your second question just your perspective on the age of the founders that it's yeah. always the well, young people we all need to face up we all need to face up to, for, for that we definitely need to face up to the fact that um, if you're building a business from here and right now and there isn't a sense of deep customer and consumer <coughs> understanding of a very younger nature and if technology is not i'm saying at the base of it see i think people over dramatize technology and for a lot of us we find technology to be intimidating i think it's not it's the consumer that's moving and therefore technology is moving it's not always the technology is moving and the consumer is moving so if you can catch that loop in a in the right sense of a merry go round giant wheel whichever way you want to go horizontal or vertical axis it will make a huge difference so but i think yes unfortunately we have to admit that um, today's founders are younger than young so ronnie quick follow up on this because i was listening this millennial yes you're right so the sense of entitlement is high yeah and 
uh, they uh, they want to be aware and more involved, right? But here's the problem. So one of the businesses, my entertainment business, which is your lifestyle mm -hmm. brands, film fair, Femina, Grazia, Hellos, young. Obviously, the age of uh, my workforce is relatively younger. Here's the problem. So I meet young talent, bright bright guys and girls, and after seven months, they're wanting to quit. And I'm like, why? And like, you know, I want to make an impact. I'm like, but you're seven months in the company. First, understand what the company does. And obviously, I can't involve you in certain aspects until you learn certain aspects. So you can't, I mean, I think it comes from instantly I'm, I'm doing the grunt work. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not really trying to do uh, yeah. strategize for the company. How do you tackle this problem? Because I mean, we, we all value the experience only after we've experienced it. I remember when I was, you cut back to me 10 years ago, I thought the experience was highly overrated. But I'm they're moving to just to another job, you're saying, or what? Yeah, but I, I think it's tough to satisfy, for them to get sa satisfaction and you know, yeah. because you'll always start it's a tough one, and up. I can tell you, I think it's a tough one. And even though I vowed that I would, didn't want to run a company and do HR, I think in Upgrad, I am playing an HR role again. And it's a very one-on-one. -on -one. It's you've got to deal with it in a very one-on-one -on -one person. It is very, very. It is not only time-consuming; it can suck, suck your energy. Yeah, it can suck your energy out. But I'm telling you, it's worth it because if you can work with that framework and sit with them and understand that actually, if you keep doing this, you won't learn or grow over the next six years, yeah. for sure. Because one year, one year, one year, your learning curve, and then it's all going to be at that flat level. Mm. Your, your bank balance might get a little bit better or may get a little bit worse. But nobody, you won't have respect at the end of it, and your learning curve will be bad. But that requires a lot of one-on-one, -on -one yeah. anecdotal, and not, I did this. Nobody wants to hear what you did, yeah. and therefore, I'm experienced. If you start by saying, look, I come with 30 years of experience. Will you please listen to me? You're dead duck. If you're doing that, you're wasting your time. So I wanted to ask you that before you, uh, you know, set your mind on the uh, education business, yeah. I'm sure there are a couple of sectors you looked at very closely and then decided that they were not what you wanted to do. Uh, do you want to talk about one or two of those? Actually, I think to a certain extent, now in retrospect, I can't even think why I did. It started because I wanted to understand sectors, so I looked at five or six sectors. And my first um, North Pole bearing was, if I find the right co-founder, I'll choose that sector. Again, serendipity and luck proved it differently from that perspective, hopefully. Because I, may, I, would have gone, into, I would have gone into packaged food, because I actually found the best co-founders in packaged food. Uh, but I just can't visualize what I would have done in that sector with my strengths, not with anybody else. Phenomenal sector, whatever else. And I, I did, I found those most, but by the time I found them and I started interacting and then I started writing down what I would like to do and what would be the vision, it didn't turn me on. Uh, and that's why I kind of let it pass. And the education part is really where it was not high on my priority till I started understanding and meeting a lot of people. And I met a lot of people and my fourth floor neighbor from whom I bought the fifth floor house that I was staying in, he runs, uh, he was the India CEO for the largest um, consultancy firm in education called Parthenon. You know, so, and he came up because I think ENY or somebody were buying Parthenon. So he wanted to do an MBO. So he was using my entrepreneurial brain to pick my brains on that. And I was using his education brain to figure out more and more. And every Sunday we spent four hours. But two hours he'd want to figure out how do I buy back my company. And I would spend <laughs> two hours to figure out with him about education. And then one fine day he said, look, I got these three phenomenal boys and they're all leaving the company. But if you want to start something in education, hire them. <coughs> That's it. As simple as that. I think we put too much. Uh, sometimes there's too much overthinking on that. Hi. Um, first of all, I, I, I have to share that uh, I'm very impressed and touched with the line that you made, uh, Ronnie, about uh, I see we should mention our failures and I was back 22 years as a fresh grad when I came out for an interview and my folder had all the success mark sheets and I had two failure mark sheets at the end and the interviewer asked me why is this in I said probably I've learned more from these two so you took me back there I'm impressed thank you I have a question in fact I would um, I look forward to hear your thoughts on these um, we heard words like 
uh, humility and and uh, humble and modest uh, about you from Deepak. Uh, very happy to hear that, and we've experienced that in the last um, 60 odd minutes, 90 minutes that we've heard you. That uh, whatever Deepak said was not just part of an interview introduction. He meant what he said. A question which has always bothered me personally or has concerned me is, as a country, um, there is so much to do in an area where we value uh, the human capital. We value human beings. Things as simple as um, the often use of words, thank you and sorry and please and basic value for human beings. Um, I, I look forward to hear your thoughts, Ronnie, being a good human being, uh, sharing your narrative in such a heartfelt and a modest way for the last uh, couple of minutes, and a successful entrepreneur. If you have to share your thoughts on how can we as business leaders make a little bit of influence and learn from an influencer, a strong, uh, uh, shining influencer like you, what baby steps could be taken in that direction that we see this 130 crore country learning these lessons of modesty and valuing human beings? So maybe, I'd, sure. maybe, maybe my first point there would be that it may not be as big as a problem as we think it to be. Because I think each of us look at other people in a very different manner, but everyone's got their own backstory and everyone's got what they want to do. So my, my first uh, submission would be, let's not be that judgmental. Um, and I don't think it's an India problem. If it is, if you look at it, I think the West can be even worse when it comes to those situations. So we should not taint it in one big brush as far as that is concerned. And second, it's a very individualistic thing. Um, and I think most of them you learn from your own experiences, right? I think humility is a word that is, is one word. But if you, if you look at, to me, I think it stems from curiosity. Like if I'm constantly curious, I can't but be humble. And because this humble is not about saying yes, sir, no, sir. And I can tell you I come from three sectors in the industry. Everyone says, sir. And you know that they don't mean anything about the sir when they're saying yes, sir, thank you, sir. They don't mean that. So that can be very superficial from that perspective. I think it's a very individualistic thing. If you are curious, I think humility comes there. And again, I can give you one anecdote. Um, when Rupert Murdoch uh, came down to India, and he was looking at that. And it really struck me, actually, that for what he had accomplished at that stage, he came in. We were in a basement office in Shivsagar Estate here. And I remember uh, we were going to make a presentation. And all we were worried about is that I hope he doesn't want to go to the loo, because the loos were not getting that key. And the first thing he came in there and says, where's the toilet? <laughs> you know? And then it was going to be a 30 minute. All his guys had put down a schedule. You know. 10.01 to 10.03, 10.03 to so and so. None of that happened. And the 10 to 10.30 meeting went on to 11.30 because he was just phenomenally curious, extremely engaging and dis disarming around the world. And after that, it didn't make a difference. Where, what, and, and that, to me, was a much more impactful situation. And for me, you actually get a lot done. Because if you can be disarming with people, they're going to open up, and you're going to get a lot more done. But it, as long as you feel there's a distance, so it's a self-realization from, from, from that perspective. you know. And I picked up that lesson from him a lot in that early stage. Uh, and I remember about seven, eight months later, I'd just gone and drop into his office at 20th Century Fox. And again, we've had this nice 15 minute where he says, how's the investment going, whatever else. And then I got up to leave. And he followed me. And, I said, uh, and he said, no, no, I'm going to show you to the door. And then in between, he sort of looked at one photograph, and he said, look, this is all of Century City in Los Angeles. And 20th Century Fox own all of this. But now we only have this part, and the rest is gone. So I thought, OK, maybe it was a real estate deal. I said, what happened? He said, Cleopatra happened. You know, At that time, they had to sell 75% of the land at that stage. He said, I, I didn't own the company, so I'm not taking the brain for it. But I'm just giving you that as, you know, when you get into that engagement level, I think for all of us, we need to understand that we need to be engaging. And especially if you're going to start dealing with the challenges of the question on our founders' age, um, millennium people, how are you going to be able to do that? I think you have to be disengaging. You have to be curious. So humility then will just flow. It's just a conversation. I, there's no guidebook that 
what am I doing, what you're doing, what somebody else would do. I think Deepak's gone to the restroom, but I'll take the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no, don't worry, I'm fine. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, uh, regarding, uh, this is a business uh, uh, question and uh, um, there's something which I grapple with uh, um, uh, earlier too. Uh, you, you talked about uh, uh, one learning which you had and if you had to uh, get that learning, uh, it would be focus, right? And you also uh, talked about the importance of taking risks and uh, um, I mean, uh, also breaking the glass, glass ceiling. Uh, so how do you balance both and is there any examples of uh, taking risks while maintaining focus uh, also? I think risk is an inevitable one. Uh, you know, I think the problem in any organization that you build, even if it's 50 people or 500 people, I think one of the first things I have in my weekly review meeting is I just ask people, so casually, you know, somebody's stumbling in late, you're five minutes early, you want to have a conversation. I think one of my first questions I normally ask is, so guys, what are the risks you took last, this week? You know, and obviously somebody will say X, Y, Z. And you need to figure out whether you're really running an efficient organization because you'll hear what kind of, what people define as risks. And you'll be, you'll be amazed at you know, how non-risk those risks can be. Because I think most people at that stage are scared. So I think risk is a very, very important. I don't mean in a bad manner, but I think it's very, very important because otherwise it's not gonna be. We can talk about failing and failing fast, but I think risk is a very important element. Focus is, I think, in India, something that is a virtue that all of us can easily learn from because it just, I think the scale comes in opportunities where you can focus. I'm not the best example of that, so I don't think I can impart for you because even today one would say, okay, but you're running something not for profit and you're running something in profit, but you also produce movies and you have a kabaddi team, so what's the story? Uh, and I'm saying, so I may not be the best example for that, but my context of focus has been that I can focus on, st on, my, strengths, on my strengths from that perspective and I wouldn't start anything without co-founders. So that is my solution for wanting to do what I want to do without necessarily feeling that I'm the person. And I was very clear when I committed to Aswadesh Foundation that I couldn't run anything else because if I was going to commit 30% of my time to a not-for-profit, there's no way I could be a CEO and commit 100% of my to a for-profit. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Ronnie. Uh, we have heard lots of it. What is the one thing that inspired you the most? And who is that person who inspired you the most in these so many years? Yeah, well, I don't want to sound rude, but I don't think there has been that influence. Uh, and I think for all of us, if we were to sort of introspect, I think it's different people, different organizations, at different stages in your life of what you want to do would be, would be what, what would have inspired you. Sometimes situations inspire you, learning inspires you. I think we over-dramatize and overrate the context of a role model. Um, so I don't think today if I were to have that, I, I would have a role model. And I think when people, younger entrepreneurs, and I deal with a lot of them, partly because in some of the companies I invested, but mostly because I just, something that interests me to do. Uh, and you know, everyone talks about mentorship and I said, look, for me, the best mentorship I can get is when somebody asks me hard questions that I've not thought of. And I would say, damn, why didn't I think of that? And that's my best mentorship I've had is when people have asked me hard questions. If I lean on people to give advice, the probability of me taking that advice is very low because I don't think they'll ever get the total picture for me to give the advice. So I think when people look to mentorship, I keep saying, look, I'm happy to sit down here, but I'm gonna ask you more questions, but not really give you your final word on that. And I think that's the best all of us can do when we're talking to different people, whether it's uh, you know, our younger generation or anything else that we want to do, is just ask the tough questions that they may not have thought. To me, that's huge mentorship. Looks like people are getting thirsty. Great. I think, please. Is the mic on? We can hear you without the mic, actually. <laughs> I just want to make one comment. I've known Ronnie for a long time. I've had the privilege of working with him long back. I met him after many, many years. Uh, he used the word millennial. I want to use the word reborn millennial. That's Ronnie. <laughs> no, he's not, nothing has changed. His same uh, ebullient, jubilant uh, self. So it's wonderful to catch up, Ronnie, and 
and, and I'm sure you'll, you'll make another big success of your educational foray. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ronnie. I think um, for me personally, it's been again, I've learned something else uh, every time, and that's why I look forward to all our meetings. I'm sure the, um, uh, the, the people here have also uh, enjoyed themselves and, and learned from this. Thank you so much for taking time out to thank do you. this. Thank really you appreciate much. it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and we're just going to request you to come together for a quick photograph. Well, ladies and gentlemen, looks like the conversation literally raised the bar, which is why we're now going to open the bar for all of you to carry the conversations forward over drinks and dinner. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's have a round of applause for another very inspiring Thursday that all of you have been part of. Thank you so much again.